Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Brentwood. We'll start today with an invocation by Patrick Wright, and he's also going to lead the Pledge and Four-Way Test. Double duty today, so open. Oh, wait. It's adjusted for four. Oh, great. Four All right. Minutes. Thank you. Would you all bow with me in prayer? Almighty God, we come to you today with thankful and grateful hearts. And we appreciate this day that you've given us for its blessings, its opportunities, and also its challenges. We praise you for the beauty of your creation that we're enjoying now in this springtime and for your grace and mercy towards us. We pray for strength and guidance in all that we do, and may we be challenged to always give our best. We remember those among us today in our Rotary family who are ill, specifically Bill McCarthy, Leon Partain, Jared Tanksley, and Rick Finke. We also pray that you would comfort our members who are dealing with issues only known to them and to you, and that you work in each of those circumstances. Please bless this food to nourish our bodies and prepare us for service, and bless us during this time that we share. May we always seek your will, and please help us to live out, live into our motto of service above self. Amen. Would you join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible with liberty and justice for all. And now please join me in the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Number one. Number two. Number three. And number four. Now our club secretary will introduce guests and visiting Rotarians. All right, we've got several guests today, and I'm going to have Lennis introduce his guest first. Oh, that, that was that was a surprise. Uh, I, I'm glad my friend uh, Bob Thompson is here. Bob, you want to say uh, a word or two to introduce yourself? I'm uh, a, a transplanter from California about two years ago. Um, I've hit that stage in my life where it's time to give back. I haven't been involved in Rotary before, but I thought this would be a good opportunity. Glad you're here, Bob. Thank you. Welcome. Bob. We have two Rotarian visitors, and I'll let Kathy and Jill introduce themselves. Thank you. We're a guest of Jim Villers. <laughs> I'm Kathy Reynolds with the uh, Franklin Evening Club. I'm the president at this time, and I brought with me Jill Luna who is a great friend and also a member of the evening club. And we're going to have a little commercial after a while. Thank you all for coming. Well, welcome. And I'm going to have uh, John prep introduce his two guests. I'd like to introduce uh, with me today is my mother, Linda Kreft, and in my better half, my wife, Jody Kreft. Glad to have you. And that is it. Awesome. Susie, do you want to say a couple of words about the upcoming district conference, please? Thank you. So when you get back to your email, you'll see an email from me. Registration is, is open now for the district conference. It is a gathering of everybody in the district. It is a celebration of the year. Anyone can come. You don't have to be an officer. We have events starting Friday lunch and going through Saturday evening. Friday lunch is going to be our regular club meeting. So instead of being here on Friday for lunch, we will be at the district conference. Our speaker is going to be great. It's Doug Englin, who is a pilot and was one of the ones who created the mission to go and kill Osama bin Laden. So he's got great stories, especially because a lot of his information has now been declassified. So definitely plan on that for lunch, Friday the 19th of May. But if you can join us for the rest of the conference, it's going to be great. We're going to go to the rodeo. We've got an auction. We've got lots of great educational seminars. So you'll have a link in your email today about registration. Thank you. But don't register for Friday lunch. We're going to do that separately. Register for everything else but Friday lunch. Right. <laughs> And that lunch registration should be out today. Uh, let's see. 
Casino night. Please don't forget to sign up for casino night. Even if you don't play casino games, come anyway, because it's just going to be a fun night of uh, club fellowship and social activity. Uh, let's see. Patrick is, uh, you want me to, we'll let Patrick have a break right now. Um, all right. Golf tournament. Listen up, everybody. The golf tournament all of the sponsorship levels that involve a team have been sold. We are encouraging, Larry said it would be super helpful if everybody could encourage their sponsors to sign up online, to do their registration online instead of via paper form. So please keep selling um, and whole sponsorships we need. Other sponsorships are available. Go online, see what's there and sign up online. Uh, Patrick. Thank you. The gift just keeps on giving today, guys, right? Um, just a quick note. Um, there is a blurb in your latest billing statement that should have come to you in the last couple of days about um, doing all we can to kind of shore up our, our balances before the end of this rotary year. This also happens to be the end of my term. So as a commercial banker, I'm treating this as quarter end. Uh, it's a reporting quarter that gets noticed. So we focus on those a little bit more. So um, I'm going to be here a couple of weeks in May with my little um, app that I can take your payments on. There's also instructions. There's our mailbox, which most of you know, and there's also a couple ways that you can pay online. Um, Mr. Hulse will be taking my space. So you'll get rid of the hack that you've had for the last three years trying to do this job. So I'd like to leave a uh, as clean a uh, slate for him as possible. So thank you for that. Awesome. Uh, next, this is a very important announcement. Everybody, please listen. Next week, we are meeting at the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home, not at the Martin Center. So I will uh, include that in the reflections for next week as a reminder, but we're meeting there, not here. Um, let's see. Now we're going to have a quick rotary minute. Anybody recognize that dude? You got it, Paul Harris. So the reason that uh, we're showing Paul Harris on the screen today is that Wednesday was his birthday. He was the founder of Rotary, but he was just one man with a dream of self-improvement. That humble dream soon grew into local fellowship before expanding into community service on an issue that was very important at the time in downtown Chicago. Who knows what that was? What was Rotary's very first service project? <laughs> Public toilets. <laughs> um, okay, so like other visionaries whose dreams have exceeded their expectations, Paul Harris is one such man. Once the dream was put into motion, it grew and grew until it began to swallow the whole world in the form of today's million member international institution, including Rotarians from 33,000 clubs in over 200 countries, including all of you, most of you. There we go, Paul Harris, happy birthday. Now we're going to have a commercial from our friends with the downtown Franklin Evening Club. We got something for you. <laughs> we got props. Oh, yeah. But um, we want to present you with, oh, you left it on the table. The post. Oh, the post. I'm Kathy Reynolds. As I said earlier, I'm the president of the Noon Rotary Club in Franklin. And Jill Luna is with me. Jill is one of our chairs for our up and coming fundraiser, which will be May 6th. And she's going to give you a little information about that. But we do want to, the rodeo guys came to ours and presented a poster so we wanted to present a poster to you and and when is your golf tournament what date is that oh and you're already sold out with your sponsors and your well not completely sold out okay just the ones that included a golf team we okay got plenty of room but you got them. you got and what about uh golf teams right you got rooms for golf team they're full the sponsorships that include a team are full what about, can you just do a team sale? Uh, no. Yes, they're going to. Yeah. They are. Okay, well, we're going to commit to a team. 
We are gonna we're gonna commit to a team. Um, we do have a lot of golfers in our club, and we need to be sponsoring, helping um helping you with your fundraisers. But thank you so much for having us today, and I'm gonna turn this over to two. I do want to say we share something. You all share something with our club, and that is a precious couple. You share the Jim Villers of that couple and we've got the Jamie Builders of that couple <laughs> and I know what an instrument he has been in 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 this uh club for y'all so Jill take it over okay hey everybody I'm Jill Luna and I'm one of the co-chairs for this year's 2023 Jockeys and Juleps big Kentucky Derby event uh, and we have it every year at Harlansdale Farms and it's just beautiful out there we get a great big tent we have, uh, I've passed out on everybody's table a little bitty, uh, some information called You're Invited. And all of y'all are invited to come and buy a ticket. Um, the tickets are on our website, uh, downtownfranklinrotary.com. That information is in here. It tells all about the party. Um, we just got so many fun things to do. It's We're going to have the derby, the live stream derby going on under the tent. So when you get there, you're going to see these huge screens. And the race is going to be happening, all the pre-race events. We're going to have um, the downtown uh, band from Nashville is going to be playing afterwards after the derby is over with. We're going to have an open bar. Uh, we've got Uncle Nearest Bourbon, um, who has a distillery in Shebaville. They're going to be having their bourbon there. We have Lippman Brothers, who's got or is going to take care of our main bar. Um, so there's just a lot of fun things. We're going to have the best dressed uh, filly and the best dressed colt. Um, and people really dress up and it is so much fun. You know, get your fascinator, your hat, y'all wear your, you come however you want to, but it's really fun to dress up. So we'd love to have y'all uh, by a table. We're still um, open for some sponsors. If you'd like to sponsor or make a donation to our event. And all the money raised goes to our charitable foundation. I know you guys have that too. Um, and then we, uh, people pl apply for grants and we give the money out all, uh, all over Williamson County. Um, so anyway, it's a great event. We'd love for y'all to come. I think once you come, you're going to look forward to coming every single year. So I'd love to see you guys there. So and come introduce yourself after you get there. I don't see Curry here, but I know that he usually attends that event and has wonderful things to say about it. He loves it. Uh, so now I guess we will have unhappy, happy bucks. Um, this is Skip Hebert's very last meeting with us before he moves away to Georgia. And uh, so it's with sadness that I say that Skip is doing happy bucks for the last time. I'm going to start out happy bucks. Hello. I'm going to start out happy bucks. Uh, if anyone was here last week, uh, you know, I announced that uh, last week was going to be last week. So my true confession was I broke the four way test. I'm so sorry about that. But today, the movers are on their way uh, as we speak. They will be here tomorrow. So this will be my last meeting. Mike. Thank you very much. Um, I put in um, money for I have two announcements, and then there's an extra dollar in there for the Alan Trigway delinquent money. <laughs> Uh, my first announcement is I will not be here for the next board of house. My first announcement is we will not be here. I will not be here for the next two weeks. Susan and I leave tomorrow for Sri Lanka and India for, for 18 days, but we will return. Uh, my second announcement, um, we have been friends and neighbors for 35 years. We've been fellow Rotarians for 25 plus years. We were married on the same day in the same year, just not to the same woman and each other. That's good. Uh, <laughs> but we have shared a lot over the years. Uh, and Matthew lost her shooter. <laughs> uh, we lament our loss here, but Atlanta is gaining a great planet. Uh, please join me in a toast to our dear Padre here. <laughs> here. here.
I'm going to cry again. Better watch it. Everybody got the email that was supposed to come through Club Runner last night, and you got it two times this morning. So woohoo! <laughs> um, but anyway, we finally got it to go through thanks to the help of many. But um, community grants just opened up, so we're happy about that. It's time to give out all this money we raised and worked hard for, and got all the donations. So if you guys will apply for those, we look forward to receiving them. Okay, I put a dollar in. My um, I'm really happy because my daughter just got accepted to a 12 week program, occupational therapy traveling. It's something she's always wanted to do, and she can sock away the money. And my second dollar is if anyone knows an accountant that understands travel, nurses and occupational therapists and how to do taxes, just come to me and let me know. <laughs> so we got two things I'm happy about. First of all, uh, last week he was drinking out of a, the IT fire hose. I'd like to thank Steve Huff uh, for doing yeoman's duties uh, with the computer last week. Uh, and then I'm grateful to my friend Bob uh, Thompson uh, coming today. Glad he's uh, had an opportunity to see our club in full flight. <laughs> well, I'm putting in twenty dollars, but I don't have twenty. I don't have twenty things to say, but I do have a two. No, sir. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had anybody ask. We want to ask that. Too. Oh, that's nice of you to ask. Uh, I want to uh, thank a big shout out to uh, Susie Lindsay because uh, she was able to help us get our our uh, jockeys and juleps tickets on our website, and that's been a huge blessing. And secondly, there's been a huge blessing in that um, my 88 and 87 year old parents I found a place assisted living for them, so I'm very very happy. <laughs> So I've got $5 today for a couple of announcements. Um, first and foremost, I've had an awesome week as a parent. I've got a freshman in college who's actually making halfway decent grades in a very difficult uh, academic environment. He kind of hinted what they were going to be before he came home, which I thought that's a good sign. Number two, as a father, my daughter is a sophomore on the Brentwood High softball team. And uh, not only are they leading their district and all the wonderful things that go along with that, but she hit her first career home run uh, outside the ballpark uh, uh, this weekend, followed then by in the next game a triple, the next game a double, and then the next game a single. So she hit the cycle over four games. So we made a really big deal in our house. So that's my second thing. The third thing is um, it's the sad note, and it's how much I'm going to miss my friend Skip. Um, Skip and I have been friends since I joined the club. He was very kind to me when I when I uh, joined. Uh, we share some some business uh, from time to time in commercial real estate, but uh, his contributions to this club uh, are immeasurable. And uh, we're going to miss having you, but man, have a good time. It's actually good to be with you guys and be standing on my own two legs. So I just want to say thanks for all the prayers. The recovery has gone pretty well, I think. So I think uh, God works in mysterious ways, and sometimes they're pretty obvious. So again, thanks for all the prayers. I'm putting three in. I, I was going to say I really appreciate everything you did, Susie, for helping us get our jockeys and juleps up on the, our website and getting our tickets sold very easily. And I put in a dollar for you guys to be on your trip. And um, I just want to thank y'all for having us. So we enjoyed it, and thank you for lunch. <laughs> Thanks for being here. All right, I have one dollar in in Skip Hubert memoriam. We'll say I have I have one dollar because Patrick was overtime doing invocation pledge four way task, and more importantly, we got him to say duty. And number three dollar uh, reminded y'all last week, but this coming week. This Thursday, next Thursday, uh, come see us at our grand opening, 5029 Harpeth Drive in Maryland Farms, directly across from the McDonald's or the Old Stroud's Barbecue, uh, now as a, an ice cream place that escapes my memory. But anyway, that corner, that's our grand opening for our new Maryland Farms branch. Please come out and have some food and come see us. Yeah, give me a hand, everybody. 
Um, hey, um, are you related to uh, Jay Luna? Oh, how are you related to him? Oh, you married him? Oh, okay. I want to tell you something. That dollar is for Jay Luna. He was he was older than me at BGA, but uh, on the football field, guy was a monster. He was a crushing running back, and he could punt the ball. And he's big Alabama Crimson Tide guy. So. Yeah, so that dollar is for you, and I don't think it really have a dollar for you. But, uh, That's right. Go Cats. Go Cats. I'm happy because Kathy Reynolds is here today. Nice to see you. Always loved you, your husband. They've always kept me smiling because our <laughs> whole family goes to their dental practice. So uh, smiling beautifully, of course. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Zach for winning his fight. Woo! That's right. Zach, I, can you hang out with me? I need people to protect my back. Yeah. Good. yeah. And then I'm also happy for my daughter. She's graduating from MTSU, and she just accepted a job with the Japanese government as an English-speaking teacher. Uh, so she'll be uh, going over there with the Japanese consulate. Starts August fifth. Wow! Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for your friendship and Thank you. Uh -huh. So put in $10 for a couple of different reasons. So um, I'd say number one, um, I don't want to start this. Uh, I kind of thought. Anyway, so uh, if so you guys know uh, Dr. Ming Wang, I was able to, to uh, he's one of a good friend of mine, as he's some of yours. Um, his movie site got picked up. I think Charles mentioned it. Um, it'll be going to theaters uh, the 10th, uh, excuse me, the 27th of October. And we found it, we're supposed to watch the movie uh, Sweetwater last night, but unfortunately it's an independent film and it actually got pulled before we could go watch it. So this could, same thing could happen to Dr. Ming Wang's movie site uh, if people don't go to, uh, to watch it. So a few of the fellow members, I know Charles and Kip, we're going to try to get us some people to go to that event to watch it. If you'd like to have a private showing at his office, let me know. We can schedule that. There's going to be, uh, and then Kip has some more information too about the Freedom Gala where it's going to be a private event. Um, but we'd love to, to to share this story with him. If you don't know, it's about perseverance. I mean, if you know anything about Dr. Ming Wang's story, he was just phenomenal as far as even becoming to America. He had to score only four people out of the country and his providence in China were going to be selected out of a million. He was one of the four. And then he showed up in America with $50 in his pocket. And now he's a world renowned uh, surgeon and amazing man. Um, but it's all about faith and common ground and bridging the gap with in our country uh, when so many people want to talk about our differences, but what makes us similar and like how we can build the common ground. Um, to, uh, I just am really appreciative for you guys, especially the people that showed up to my fight, Miss Laura, uh, Julian, Todd, Michael, and uh, Ted. It was really awesome to see you guys there. Um, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done, but um, it was really phenomenal. And that was probably the most important to have all that you guys support there. Um, I will be training a lot more for it next year. Uh, but if you want to see it, I can send you the fight. It was the longest uh, six minutes of my life, I think. But uh, uh, but I did come out victorious, so it was great. Um, I was going to say, uh, I can't think of it. So anyway, but uh, thank you guys so much. Okay, thank you, Skip. So now uh, I am thrilled to introduce our speakers today. We have two speakers, and uh, one of my favorite programs that we do in this club is to hear from club members because it helps us get to know each other so much better. And you know, a lot of times you learn thing interesting things about people that you had no idea about. So Laura Troop is going to uh, speak to us first. Laura's been in our club for nine whole months. She works for Agape and does a whole lot of things for foster kids and Tennessee Baptist Children's Home in her spare time. She has three kiddos of her own. And uh, I'm not going to steal her thunder, but I had lunch with her not that long ago, and she's done some really cool things. So I'm excited to hear from Laura. Well, due, uh, due to happy bucks going so long, I'm out of time. Thank you. 
Just kidding. Um, well, as she said, I'm Laura Troop. Um, these are not my children. These are just children. Um, I'm pretty passionate about children. Um, I went to university to be a star. I wanted to be a vocal performer. Um, I wanted to be in the studios with the musicians. Um, and then I, I came to Nashville and I was like, I, they want me to teach and I don't want to teach music. So I said, well, what's the other option here? And so I said, okay, music business. Um, so what I did, my degree is in public relations. So for the beginning of my career, um, I dove into the music industry. Um, my first real gig um, was I was the publicist for Leonard Skinner on their tour. Um, I did all their tour promotions. So it was kind of a big dive into, um, into what the industry was like. And um, it was really fun, really fun, kind of crazy. Um, lots of stories. I have lots of stories. Um, but then um, from there, migrated into book publicity with those musical artists. And that's how I got to know Jonathan Merck, who introduced me to this club, um, who has since moved to Hermitage, Mount Juliet, somewhere in there. Um, and he is a, he's still a great friend. I'm really proud of the work that he does in publishing. Um, but because of that, I had so many really great connections with, um, with great people. Um, I could name drop like crazy and tell you some awesome people I hung out with. I loved doing, uh, memoirs with people who had great stories to tell. Um, I did cookbooks with some really great, um, chefs who, who are world renowned. Um, Wolfgang Puck is one of my favorite people. Um, and I got to do his cookbook back in 2003, um, 2002, um, I got to work with country artists who were doing great things behind the scenes that a lot of people didn't even know about. Um, but I love to tell stories and storytelling is a really important part of, of my life, but it should be for all of us. Um, I think it's really valuable for us to share our stories with each other, the, the pieces of who we are so that we can grow together. We grow in context of relationship. And so when we share our stories and we find where those common threads come together, then, then we grow as individuals, okay? Um, I have name dropped a little, but the most important people um, are, are my family. Um, I have three great kids. Um, I have a husband who I've been married to for almost 20 years, and, um, and, and he's the best partner I could ask for. Um, and a few years ago, we said, oh my goodness, why is God calling us to fostering? That is not the path that I thought we would ever go on. But when I was a kid, my parents had taken in a pregnant teen um, in Alabama. She had her babies in our home and we maintained a close relationship. We're still connected today. And we were sitting across the lunch table from one another. And I've probably told pieces of this story before, but she said, you can do this. And I said, do what? And she said, foster. If you have room in your house and love in your heart, you can foster. And so we prayed about it for a really long time, um, at least a year, but she planted a seed that day. Um, I don't think I'm a great parent. Um, I have really, really easy kids, really easy kids. Um, but becoming a foster parent made me a better parent because I learned so much about what, um, what trauma can do to kids kids who don't have what most of us in this room have, not to say that someone in this room hasn't experienced hard things, but we all deserve powerful relationships that help us thrive. And because of our insulated, protected lives, we all have had an opportunity to thrive. Every single one of us, um, even if we've experienced hard things because of where we live and when we live here, um, we're, we're in good shape. Um, and so we were busy. That was about the hardest thing in our life is that we were busy. Um, so we said, this is really something that can call us into a deeper relationship with the Lord. And so we said, all right, let's do it. Um, and so our foster experience, we've had about 20 kids in our home and it's been some of the hardest experiences of my life, but they've made me a better mom. They've made me a better friend. Um, they've made me more aware to the needs of people around me because I've been on a happy face a lot of days um, when I would have 
hard a hard time with the kids that we had in our home. And you never ever would have imagined the chaos that was going on inside the four walls. Hard, hard things. Um, kids who have anger expression, kids who um, would dissociate and not know where they were sometimes. And that's not my story. That's theirs. But what I could do is lean on the people who were around me, who had inserted themselves into my life because they loved me to make these kids' lives better. We talk about stress all the time when we talk about foster care and each of you has experienced stress. Um, See if I can get this to cooperate. Okay. There we go. Okay, so at Agape, we talk about um, about stress, and stress is alleviated by meeting a child's need, right? And who in here has had a child or ever held a child, right? Okay, good. So when when you have a child who has a need that has to be met, they express it by crying, you figure out what the need is, you figure out how to meet that need, and you comfort that child. You know, we bounce them like this. We make eye contact. Oh, what a good baby. You know, we we love on them. And that connection is how we build relationship with them. But if you have a 15-year-old in your home, you can't do, oh, you sweet 15-year-old. It's not, not great. So we do that in other ways. We got to get creative about how we love on each other. But their expressions of needs are just like our expressions of need. Behavior is an expression of need. And so you might say, what is wrong with that kid who's screaming in the grocery store or who is um, throwing something in their class at school. They have a need that they haven't learned how to express because maybe a parent hasn't met that need over and over again. Our day-to-day stressors in our lives, you know, many of us have them, most of us have them, um, and we respond to them in our own way. But sometimes we don't let kids express their needs. You know, we expect them to have positive attitudes and happy dispositions and respectful response to us when we have bad days all the time. We express hard things in our own lives. And so patience with children is the number one way that we can love kids who are experiencing hard things. Um, And that happens, that happens in our homes, that happens in our churches, that happens in the grocery store with a person who you don't know. It's grace and patience and, um, and a little bit of Um, empathy toward that person. That's the thing I'm most passionate about. And I never thought I'd get here. I love touring with artists. I loved hitting the circuit in New York city, hitting all the, the morning talk shows and magazines and, um, and big newspapers who were covering stories on my artists or my authors, but the stars, the successful, amazing, um, people in my life have been the people who have knelt down. They've gotten down on a child's level and sat with them in a hard space and said, it's okay, buddy. I know you're having a hard time. Or it's the, it's the child who's been through so much, but they sacrificed their own well-being to care for their younger brother or sister who came in to care with them. Um, and I'm not here to guilt trip you or tell you that you need to be a foster parent or, or to, to push you towards something like that. I just want you to know that every single one of you in this room has the capacity to love well and to pour into, um, this community. Cause we have a great community and in Brentwood, there are kids coming into care every single day. I got a call on Monday afternoon from a teacher at the middle school who said, help, there's a kid who right now DCS is in their driveway and we love him and we don't want him to go to somebody who we don't know. Is there anybody who can take this kid? And we found a home for that kiddo so that he can stay in his school so that the teachers can can continue to pour into him. But that's because those teachers loved him. Those teachers spoke up for him. And every single one of you in this room can love and speak up for someone who's in a difficult space. I know this isn't profound. I know this isn't new information, but I hope that my passion about this can be something that you carry. Um, Our our, uh, day-to-day at Agape is crazy. We have foster care and adoption program. It's okay. (laughs) It's okay. 
Um, we have a foster care and adoption program. Um, we, in the last 12 months, we've had 18 adoptions um, through foster care, which is incredible. Um, we have a, a very robust professional counseling program. So if you need people, if you know people who need um, counseling services, um, mental health is a major crisis today. Um, if you need someone to talk to, I can, I'd be happy to connect you with counseling program at Adape. And we also have a domestic violence program. We write um, a thousand plus orders of protection every year, just in Davidson County. Um, so Agape is doing big work and you all have been part of supporting it. We got one of your major grants um, a, a year ago and are so grateful for the impact that you've made on our organization. Um, I do want to point out, I'm going to skip through some of this other stuff that I had um, from my, the last time I talked to you. Um, but let's see if I can get there. Um, okay, we have we have a golf tournament as well. Our golf tournament is on May 1st. Um, ours is a very different model um, where all of our teams are fundraisers. Our teams do the fundraising. We do sell some sponsorships and things like that, but each team says, all right, we're going to compete. And they set up, they are required, required. They have to try to sell at, at raise at least $4,000 per team. Um, last year, we had a team that raised almost $70,000 alone. Um, and that's just because they, I mean, one of them said, Hey, I helped this guy trim trees in his yard. Um, and I said, Oh, don't pay me. Make a donation to Agape. He helped somebody paint their house. Don't pay me help Agape. So people make sacrifices, um, because they know that they can't be a foster parent. They know they can't, they can't open their home to something like that or um, aren't in a place for that, but they have, um, they have connections. So I would love for you all to be a mouthpiece to tell people about what we do. And if you feel led to give, um, give to Agape. We'd be so grateful for that. Um, and you can do your, whatever little corner uh, that, that you have, you can carve away a little corner where you can make a difference too. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. And now our second speaker for today has been a club member for two years and one month. He has a delightful wife, Jody. I do not want to be a customer of his, but I have seen him in action in his profession. And he is just the type of person you would want to have if you had to be a customer of his. John Kraft. Well, thank you for that. Uh, first, I want to start off by saying before we came here, leaving our office today, I grabbed a sheet of paper and my wife says, looks at me and says, you only have six things you did. I said, no, I think I do have a little bit more in my lifetime. So my name is John Kreft. I grew up in Illinois. Not everybody hear that correctly, Illinois. Okay. I hear a lot down here. My wife can vow for this, Illinois. I say, no, I'm not from Illinois. I'm from Illinois. I grew up in a town uh, west of Chicago, Bensonville. It's the name of the town I grew up in. I uh, grew up there going through all schools there, elementary school, high school. In high school, I played sports in high school. I played football, played basketball, played baseball. Freshman year of uh, football, knees got too bad, so I had to go play golf for sophomore, junior, senior year. Um, enjoyed sports and enjoyed watching sports. If you're from the Chicago area, one question you always ask somebody as you're going by, are you a Cubs fan or a Sox fan, right? So to me, Cubs fan or Sox fan? Cubs fan, I'll talk to you. Sox fan, I run away from you. And then you'll appreciate this too, Blackhawks fan. I don't think I can change that, Blackhawks fan. I heard a groaning. <laughs> so my occupation is I am a funeral director. Let me give you a little bit of insight of how I got into the industry. After high school, I went to Northern Illinois University for two years. Also, I played baseball there. 
uh, during my two years, I would come home from school and my cousins owned a local funeral home. So I'd come home and they'd ask me to mow the lawn at the funeral home because they were busy and they couldn't get around to that. So I did. And I think it was after my first year or one and a half years of being at, at Northern, I asked them, I said, hey, what goes on inside the building that I don't see because I'm out mowing the lawn? So I went in, they brought me in, we walked around, I was able to see what goes on in the funeral industry. And I asked them, I said, now if I go to school for this, would I be able to work here? And they said, yes, you would. So I checked into the school, mortuary school. Mortuary school was one full year. It was September to September. I thought to myself, well, I'm at NIU going to be an accountant that's a lot of school. I can be out in a year and be a funeral director. What sounds better, a year or who knows when? So I pursued that. I worked at that funeral home for about seven years, worked there while I was going to school, stayed on as an apprentice, and then once I got licensed, I stayed on from there. When I was a student going to school for mortuary science, they had asked me, do you want to live above the funeral home? So they had space available. I said, yes, I'll live above the funeral home. So that was my technically first home or apartment was living above the funeral home. And started when I was dating, that's where my wife and I, we uh, were, was above the funeral home when we got married. That was technically our first apartment. Also being married was above the funeral home. <clears throat> So then as we, as we go on, after seven years, I ended up leaving there. Um, my wife and I moved to a suburb next door and I ended up leaving the industry, funeral industry for about a year. Got back into it because a funeral home had tracked me down to work for them. It was a, a girl who owned the funeral home, her and her dad. And I went to high school with her and they tracked me down to work for them. I was there for 20 years. After 20 years, then I finally ended up leaving there. And I, after, after that, I thought to myself, I was pretty much running that funeral home at the time. And after that, I thought to myself, do I really want to work for somebody else anymore? I've done this on my own for so long. Why can't I have my own? So that's when I got in touch with um, somebody that could help me out with that. And so that's how... We got here. We got here because of the lady um, who does finances for me, she uh, does only financing for funeral home buyers and sellers. And she found out uh, Austin Funeral and Cremation Services was available. And so my wife and I were on vacation at the time, matter of fact, and we're going back and forth, having to run to the library to get things off to her email and things like that. And so it ended up working out to where we were able to purchase Austin Funeral and Cremation Services in December of 2019. Um, our office is in Maryland Farms on Maryland Way. We're in the chapel building. We do not have a physical brick and mortar funeral home. We are in our work out of an office building, but most of our services are done at family's local church or some other type of uh, center that maybe the family has a choice or even we've done it at restaurants before, there's a celebration of life, but that's how our business model is set up. I've been licensed as a funeral director for uh, about 30 years. Being a funeral director, people think that like when you go to funerals, that they see us standing there. And that's all we do. Well, that's not all that we do but there's a lot more that goes into it. But also too, it's time. There have been many events with my children or family that I have missed over the years because of the amount of time that I am working because our phones are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And weekends in my industry, they don't matter. 
My wife's been gracious, been a champ over the years with the children of taking them without dad around and hasn't balked at it one bit. She, I hope she knew what she was, I think she knew what she was getting into when she married me, but um, she hasn't balked at it one bit and has been great. Um, as a funeral director, I've had many challenging times, but I do have to tell you the most challenging time that I've ever had over my entire career was the COVID. Having to sit and talk to families during COVID and seeing the look on their face that they cannot celebrate the life of a loved one with their entire family. They can only limit it to five people, 10 people, but we have 30 people. I'm sorry, we can't do that. That was the most challenging, the most difficult time in my career. And that's something I will never forget. Let me tell you a little bit about my family. Um, I introduced my mom. She's with us today. Uh, my wife is with us today. My dad passed away in 2011. Um, and I guess I should say that's another one of the other challenging parts of my, my business is when my dad did pass away. I'm the one who took care of all the arrangements for him. Um, there were certain things I could not do, but I think I even surprised my mother by running the entire funeral, saying the prayers, doing everything for my dad. Um, my wife and I have three children. So John, Jody, 24-year-old daughter, Jamie, 20-year-old daughter, Jordan, 16-year-old daughter, Jenna, five Js, three girls, but the three girls, they never talk back, they don't fight, surprising, right? <laughs> Untrue. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel, everybody has, has it, but uh, the the greatest thing I have is I have my mom, my wife, my family, um, my daughters, um, my oldest daughter. She right now, she's going for her master's online through LSU for psychology. My middle daughter, she's working uh, full time for a trucking company, doing fantastic. And then my youngest one is a sophomore in high school. Also amongst my family is I do have a sister. My sister did live in Illinois, um, not too far from us. Um, just recently, her husband got a new job down in Florida, so they moved down to Florida, um, but I do have one sister. Just like to talk about uh, a few things that, uh, in my mind, I feel like I've either accomplished or was happy I did. First thing would be um, all conference baseball and golf in high school. I bowled uh, two 300 games, um, bowled in a league for probably about 10, 10 12 years, I think it was. Um, also, I was in Taekwondo, and I ended up getting to my third degree black belt in Taekwondo. Um, and finally, Cub Sox. I was able to attend the Cubs World Series game, the fifth game of the World Series that kind of changed the whole thing. And I was at Wrigley Field in the bleachers, which was really cool and a great memory. So I guess I could open up if anybody has any questions. A lot of people are interested in my industry. I know that there might be a few questions, be more than happy. Great story. Uh, I was going to ask you about the Atlanta Braves, but I won't. <laughs> um, tell me about your business model. If someone is deceased in the hospital, where do you go? How Physically, how does it happen? Sure. 
So our business model is, like I said, we don't have a brick and mortar building, but um, at we work out of the chapel building on Maryland Way. So in there, we have an office space, we have conference rooms. So if somebody passes away at home, nursing home, uh, hospital, whatever, we have a facility that's off site that we use for any preparation that needs to be done uh, for viewing and also for cremation. So we work hand in hand with them and coordinating with them to have the person transferred into our care and all the preparation necessary for if you're doing viewing or cremation. I don't know if this is a morbid question or not, but it's a curiosity. In your business, do you see a trend between traditional plot burial and cremation? The uh, And I get asked that question all the time. That's a very good. Um, the last stat that I read for traditional to cremation, cremation nationwide now is about 55% to traditional burial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, John, um, actually, I'm asking on behalf of a friend of mine, Keely. <laughs> we used to think uh, Linus uh, in his Chicago accent was pretty thick, but could you do a dick for us? <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> the bears. <laughs> Hey, John, um, what do you think, or what would you say the one or maybe two things about your job that you get most fulfilled about? I would say one thing I get most fulfilled about is that working with families at basically the heart, one of the hardest times of your life and being able to get them through that because most people have no idea where to start or what to do. And I just feel like in my heart, I'm helping them out um, in the worst time of their life at that time. So the funeral procession, uh -huh. do you always let the whole thing go through and wait like forever and everybody pulls over? Right. Or do you just kind of make sure you don't get in their way? You just... Uh, Kind of make sure you don't get in their way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The there there's no um right or wrong way to do it, but my feeling has always been is that pull over to the side, let them go. Because being up in the Chicago area, they did not care. We had people cutting in and out of processions constantly, and it was terrible. One of the uh, hardest things and one of the most rewarding things that I have done was volunteer for the funeral for uh, Will Kenny, one of the kids murdered in Covenant. And listening to his father read the letter that he wrote to his son. How do you, how do you help a parent who has lost a child? Well, the only way I can help a parent who lost a child is I, I, I need to do, I keep my mind and my focus on my aspect of the funeral service part of it and what I need to do. And then we do have resources that we can give the family for any help for grieving and things beyond that. But uh, for, from my sense is that that's what I just try to do is I try to focus on getting the family through the next days of getting their loved one buried or cremated. Does that make sense? So two things. First of all, yeah, I like the way you, you kind of coach this on pronouncing Illinois. <laughs> and so I, I can't remember which you two ladies were up there speaking, but could you please repeat for our Northern brethren, that town that you mentioned that has uncle nearest. Okay. It's not Shelbyville. So anyway, just make sure. 
<laughs> what about so there there are lots of uh what they call alter alternative burial means that are going to they put people in suits and yeah. plant trees what, do you do any of that or what's going on with that um alternative yes matter of fact um i've been twice now to it's up north called Larks larksburg conservatory and that's what they call a green burial and what i mean by green burial is that it's up in the hills so it's basically on a walking path that you pick a state there's people that run it and you pick they go up there and, and they take like three spots for you to look at and uh, they say okay you know which spot do you want well you pick your spot and no metal caskets can be used it can only be wooden on your clothing no buttons no zippers nothing everything has to go back into the earth so and what it is it's on a walking path no cars can go up there or anything so you go up there for a service everybody has to walk up to the grave the only way you can, you can take a, a vehicle up there is the casket goes on a four wheel and they take that up there prior to the family getting there um but that that's kind of like an alternative to your traditional burial cremation type of service that, that how it's getting to be more popular um the last time i was up there was probably about uh i think it was two months ago or something like that. And I think he said that he started out a couple of years ago, only doing 20 funerals a year. And he's quadrupled it now. And he said he's getting more and more interest as time goes on. I think this will be the last one then. Yeah. Is there some protocol when someone has been cremated, when you want to put their ashes somewhere, are there, like, do you have to fill out something with EPA? I heard that one time. Is that, like, if you want to put them in an ocean or a lake or whatever? Yeah, if, if you're going to do that, um, there are services out there that do that for you, but there is paperwork for that that you need to do. Um, technically, you're not supposed to scatter ashes, um, but... Hopefully nobody's listening, but um, technically you're not supposed to, but that does happen. Um, but with going to the ocean, things like that, there are services out there in those areas that um, you just work with them and they have paperwork you sign and, and things like that to scatter. And they, they take care of the scattering in the ocean for you. Thank you so much. Real quickly, Devin has one thing. For if you want leftover to read the credit stuff, it doesn't matter. I have a few more bags over there, over there uh, in the temple. Come here, come up on one minute. If you want it, take it. There's other people. Thank you. Uh, help put away the chairs, please, in stacks of eight. And anything else for the good of Rotary next week? Go to the to Jennifer. Oh, yeah, sorry. There's a committee meeting and a casino night committee meeting right now after this one. And that's it. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.